Hi, this is Zestology, the podcast all about energy, vitality and motivation. Tony Wrighton here. Dr. Stephen Simpson is one of my regular Zestology guests. He works with top professional poker players such as Chris Mormon and Liv Borey on helping them achieve their potential in every area of your life and in every area of their life. Now, today's podcast is Dr. Steve and me sitting in Steve's garden in Portugal. It's a tough life, eh? And Steve tells me a few good stories about millionaire poker players and how we can learn from them to make our own luck. And as they landed on the table, he looked and he could not believe his eyes. He had misread the cards. He had a jack and a two, which was basically not worth very much. Dr. Stephen Simpson is an elite performance coach, medical doctor and NLP expert who specialises in a fascinating field. He's developed the niche of helping poker players win more money. Here he is, Dr. Stephen Simpson on Zestology. Well, here we are, sitting in the sunshine in Portugal. Steve, how are you doing? Very well, Tony, thanks. What about you? You look pretty happy with yeah, life. Very happy with life. You are obviously a regular guest on Zestology. And um, we've actually come around to the front of your house here in Portugal, haven't we, just to kind of shade ourselves from the wind. It's a lovely little spot in the sunshine here. It's just pretty perfect out here, isn't it? Absolutely perfect. What a wonderful place to be. Yeah, and thank you again, by the way. I don't take it for granted that I'm a regular guest on your show. Oh, delighted. I'm so pleased that you are. I don't take it for granted either. And I realise that we haven't spoke about, we haven't spoken about poker very much on the previous podcast that we've done. And that's actually become a big part of your working life now hasn't it working with quite a few professional poker players and kind of semi-pro is that is that fair to say it's fair to say yes yeah. definitely yeah and what is the kind of thing that you work with them on well i work as a mind coach so um i teach them or demonstrate to the mind skills that will help them at the table uh poker is a bit like uh, golf and uh, bridge and um uh, well, many sports really that one needs to be as emotion neutral as possible, so mm. that you make the best possible decisions. Yeah, because it, because obviously there's an element of luck, quite a large element of luck involved in poker. Yeah, but there's a huge element of skill mm -hmm. and bluff involved, isn't there as well? Yeah. And you, I know you're working with one poker player, um, Chris Mormon, which which you and I have just before we started recording this podcast, we've been chatting quite a bit about, haven't we? We've been chatting about him. He is one of the top players in the world. Oh, actually, he is the top player in the world, isn't he? In online earnings, career online yeah. earnings, he is the top player in the world. Uh, in, wow. you know, ever, How much? Ever. Uh, I, last time I looked, it was over $13 uh, million. Was that, was that Thunder, by the way? Uh, it might be a jet. All oh, right. It might be the Portuguese uh, yeah. Air Force yeah. exercising it's, their muscles. It's clearly not Thunder, is it? No. Um, so... 13, did he say 30 million dollars? 13, one right. three, yeah. Right, okay, fantastic. And of course he's won a few more million in live events. Which yeah, yeah. And so you started working with him and he had this kind of incredible moment, didn't you, when he had a chance to win a major because you have these big tournaments in poker uh, and Chris Mormon had earned all this money, biggest online earner ever, but he'd never quite been able to win a major and that was a bit of a problem for him, wasn't it? Well, in his own words, I think he put something on Twitter uh, he said it was a, a monkey on his back because uh, like all great players in any sport you are defined, your legacy is that you've won a major and so when the press interviewed him and friends for that matter they would say, you know, Chris, you're the, such a great player but you know, why haven't you won a major? Mm. And it was getting to him. Um, so he got into a position of winning a major but things didn't go to plan, did they? They definitely didn't. So he's on this final table. Yeah, he was playing in the... And he, the, he basically could have wrapped it up. Yeah, he was playing at the WPT, the World Poker Tour, the Los Angeles Classic in... Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, he'd got through five days. This was day five. He was through onto the final table. And, and this is with a chance to win a major. And what, what in terms of money would he have made at that tournament? Um, I can tell you almost exactly. Had he won, he would have won a mouth-watering one million and fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, so he's thinking there's a lot of money involved here, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of prestige because finally that monkey, that gorilla on his back, he might be able to throw it off. 
Yeah. So he, what happened? He was basically dealt some cards that were all right, but not brilliant. Is that fair to say? Yes. Now I know that a lot of your listeners don't know anything about poker. So my apologies to the poker purists. I'm going to make this really simple <laughs> for us to understand. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in poker, you're, each player is dealt two cards face down, so the other mm. players don't see it, but you do. And uh, Chris looked at his cards, and he'd been dealt a jack and a three which is nothing very special. And then the next three cards are put down in the middle of the table and you all see them. And he, that was a queen, a seven, and a five. Now that's starting to look a little bit interesting because of the various possibilities or right. outs that could yeah. make a good hand. So then one card comes down. This is the last card but one. And it was a four. Now, so here he has a four, five, a three, and a seven. Now, if you can get those in sequence, that call, that forms a straight. Right. Anyway, and that, and that could be enough for him to win his. It first could major. be. It could be. That, that could be enough for the it big could be. million. It, it could have been. Pot. It definitely could have been. That yeah. was. It was. But I mean, uh, I mean, had it not worked out, uh, it was possible that he could be knocked out at that point. So there's a lot resting. This card, this hand, doesn't mean anything at the moment, and there's one card to go. Right. But and what they, does he do? Does he start to kind of pile some money? Oh up? yeah, yeah. There will be betting on various stages. And he's thinking, I'm in here, so I'm going to go big. Well, at this point, he's thinking, I've got a card. I've got a hand here that has got quite a lot of potential. It's not a perfect hand yet. It needs one more good card. Yeah. And the last card, they call it the river card. It came down, and it was a six. Now, putting those in sequential order, yeah. as they say, he's got three, four, five, six, seven. Right. Your best yeah. five cards count. Okay. That is a straight. So it's massive. a very strong yeah. hand. And so he betted accordingly. He thought, you know, go for broke, go right, for so broke. So he's got a huge pile of chips in front of him. Yeah. And he just slides it all in, right? Yeah. He, well, you know, in the stages, he slides yeah. it all in. He doesn't go all in. Yeah. And there's only one opponent left at this on this particular hand who's still got an interest. And so right. this other guy's obviously got a good hand too. And, and if this, at this point, he's thinking, if I win this... Mm -hmm. then I've won the tournament. Is that fair to say? Well, it's not certain that he could have wrapped up the tournament in that one hand, but he would have be, taken a massive step forward yeah, yeah, to, yeah. In, to do that. Right. As I and and had, you been, you'd, had you been working with him at this point? Yeah, we, the, just in fact, just a couple of weeks before this tournament, uh, we had met in Vancouver, mm. and we'd worked intensively with each other for three days. Is that and the one where you flew... You'd only really just met him, and you weren't really quite sure if it was going to work out, but you flew there anyway. Yes, I did. It was Looking back, it was a crazy thing to do, but yeah. we'd spoken on the phone. Uh, his diary was busy. My diary was busy. And the only time I was free was this particular one week in February uh, 2014. Mm. And so I just decided to buy an air ticket. I said, OK, Chris, I'll see you in Vancouver, where he's playing in a tournament. He said, wow. oh, cool. But, you know, we had no contract, no yeah. agreement, a very much a spur-of-the-moment decision. So it's a big risk for you. Big risk. I think, I, yeah. you know, I think I remember you telling me, and I remember thinking... Well, I hope Steve knows what he's letting himself in for here. <laughs> yeah. um, well, the answer was I didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that was a couple of weeks earlier. Mm. You'd done some stuff that you'd worked for intensively for what a few days? Uh, three days, three over days. three days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all day? Uh, not all day. We'd do maybe a two or three hour session in the morning, and then two or three hour in the afternoon. So yeah, yeah. it was a bit main part of a day. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, and then going back to the cards, he's got this four, five, six, seven, eight. What Three, happened? four, oh, yeah. five, yeah, six, yeah. seven. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he's got this great hand. Yeah. So finally the betting exhausts itself. Right. And they, they call, you know, they show, it's, it's uh, the showdown. They call, they see each other's hands. And Chris flew uh, through his two cards down, jack and three. Mm. And as they landed on the table, he looked and he could not believe his eyes. Mm. He had misread the cards. He had a jack and a two which was basically not worth very much. Oh. And his how opponent... Could he, how could a professional poker player make that mistake? Well, quite easily, Tony. I mean, I, I know you're a golf uh, a fan and, and you cover golf in your job as yeah. a presenter. Uh, the pressure on the final green of yeah. a major, you see... Uh, makes you, you see, do strange things. Yeah, it makes you do strange, very strange things. And I mean... Somebody that I know you've met, uh, that guy Jean Vandervelt, who yeah, went, who yeah. had a meltdown on the last hole, yeah. uh, when he basically took his shoes off and went into the river to get his ball out. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, that, I haven't got time for that story. But yes, it's perfectly understandable how this could happen. If he wasn't in a major, I'm quite sure Chris would not have made this mistake. But he did, 
And one of the things that we talked about is that things are going to take us by surprise. Yeah. And that's when we need the control of our emotions. Oh, right, right. So, of course, what did he do? I mean, the other pay player is staring at him and can't believe his luck. And <laughs> so he just won. Because he, he cause Chris lost the hand. He lost the, the hand. Jack, the he lost every dollar he'd put in on that hand. Yeah. Which was a lot of money. Yeah. And his opponent is looking at him, not understanding what's going on. Now, there's only one thing that Chris can do at this point, <laughs> and he he did it. He had to pretend that he was bluffing and he'd been caught out. <laughs> bluffing in poker is when you try and convince your opponent that your hand is a lot stronger. Yeah. So this so. Chris tried to carry this off as a gigantic bluff. And apart from being the only face-saving way out of that, th the positive value is that that guy is not going to know when he's bluffing next time. Right. So it could work to his advantage. So to a certain extent, he actually showed, even though he'd made a horrendous cock-up, yeah. he showed presence of mind to almost turn it into some kind of positive? He, he, well, he did. And I don't imagine he was thinking like that at that time. I mean, his 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 mind would have been in turmoil i mean and he, he wanted then that there was a break after that wasn't it yeah the good news was is that the break came up very suddenly and i think a break would have been 10 or 15 minutes yeah. something like that his partner now his wife kate was there so he would have gone into the players lobby and he was livid he was it? livid yeah. he was livid i mean i don't know what he did but i can imagine there was a bit of kicking of <laughs> doors and all that going on i mean you know chris is a, a, a not at all a person like that but I mean just try and put yourself in his shoes it's the, it's the biggest professional moment of his life yeah it is yeah. and he wanted it so bad so Kate I, you know I don't know exactly what she would have said to him but she would have definitely calmed him down mm. and Chris himself said he said I went back and I remember the things that Stephen and I had talked about wow. and it helped me to put things into a better perspective and by the time I went out after the break I was really up for it wow that's so You'd really worked on expecting the unexpected and controlling what you can control. We, that was certainly an important part of our work, mm. and that, that's the kind of thing that I'd work with, um, uh, with, with any player in any sport. Yeah. Uh, only focus on what you can control, because there are so many and things... I'm just thinking in terms of people like me listening mm -hmm. who aren't in for playing professional sport, professional poker, but just applying it in day-to-day -day life. Is this relevant for living with a more motivated, you know, fulfilled life? It, it is so relevant to, for all of us. Mm. And that's why I love my job. Because, uh, as you know, I don't, I do play some poker in a small way, mm. but I'm in no way am I an expert. Um, I love working with tour golfers, and you know that I love my golf, but I would never make a living as a mm. tour player. But the great thing is is that all of us, if we can uh, if we can bury the things from our consciousness, the things that we have no control over. Mm. In poker, you can't control, obviously, what cards you're going to be dealt. Yeah. You can't control the other players and what they're doing. You, you can't control all the distractions from cameras, from friends, from the noise, all of these things. Yeah. That, and in our own lives, our li all of our lives, there are so many distractions which we can't control. Mm. The important thing may i suggest <laughs> is that we focus our energy on those few things that we can, can control. control and let go with the rest of it and let go with the rest Except so easy for us to say things like that isn't it and it's so difficult to do so what were a couple of the specific things that you did with oh actually we pro probably should just finish the story first so he went yeah. back after the break <laughs> yeah and he uh, he regrouped and uh, he, he you know he moved his mind into a much more positive place and he luck is important in all things and and he got lucky and if I can tell you one of the yeah. the, the la one of the last big hands that he played um, he had been dealt uh, ten and ten that's a yeah. pair of tens that's a pretty good uh, couple of cards to mm. get and then the next three cards came king jack queen so here we have uh another possible straight yeah and what would make that a straight would be if the last card was an ace so that would give him 10 jack queen king ace yeah and he was waiting for it seemed to him that time had stood still he was mm. waiting to see that last card be turned down face up on the on the table and he was saying under his breath a uh, breath uh, um barry greenstein barry greenstein barry greenstein let me tell the non-poker people here, Barry Greenstein is a great player who wrote a fantastic book called Ace on the River. Right. The river, as I mentioned, is the last card. So what 
Chris was exhorting was please let it be an ace and that card came down and what do you think it was Tony? <laughs> an ace. It was an mm. ace and he went so, crazy he went yeah. crazy because he knew he hadn't won on that hand but he, kn he knew that if he didn't make any more mistakes there was a very very great chance that he would win and he did win it was the 1st of March 2014 mm. he got his major he got over a million dollars he got that monkey off his back. Yeah. What about that? All thanks to Dr. Stephen Simpson. No, not at all. I, and I say this, I say oh, no, this, I know you're kidding, but I say this to everybody. I do not own my players' results. They do. Yeah. The, the most that I can do as a coach is to be a catalyst mm. to help them to uh, maximize all of their potential mm. and bring out all of their skills at the right time. So what were a couple of the things that you looked at with him and, and, what, and how could we learn from that? Okay, well, I can't uh, remember exactly what I did with Chris, but I, you know, obviously I have my notes, but I can tell you with fair conviction that I pretty much use the same methods on every client. So I would have been uh, coaching him in a technique called heart math. Yeah. And, uh, oh, we've spoken about that before. We've spoken about yeah. it before on the yeah. pods, yeah. And, and in, in a very simplistic way, it's how we can uh, coordinate our breathing and uh, bring our breathing into a good place which brings our heart into a good place, right. and then because of the neural connections from the heart to the brain. There's a lot of people who'll be listening to this and saying, breathing, it all sounds a bit kind of hippy-dippy. It sounds a little bit not connected to playing a good poker card. Well, um, some people might say that, justifiably so, yeah. but I would uh, say to them, now look, I don't think this is hippy-dippy. Uh, you may, and you may be right and I may be wrong, but what I do know is that I, I, I don't do a lot of yoga, but I know about yoga, mm. and I know that breathing is considered fundamental to yoga mm. and to many other of these disciplines. Many meditative practices. Yes, and I know, I know as a doctor that when people breathe fast and rapidly, they get stressed and tense. And when they come into casualty departments in the old days, and still now actually, we ask them to breathe into a brown paper bag. Right. And by doing that, it slows their breathing down. Yeah. And as their breathing slows down and gets deeper, physiologically, it helps to get rid of this, um, this yeah. panic attack. Yeah. So, and so bre breathing I just is took so a really deep breath then. I'm sure everyone listening did as well. Just made me think, <gasps> must take yeah. a deep breath. Yeah, yeah. I recommend it. Um, and look, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, we've actually done whole zestology shows on breathing. Yeah. And yet, I guess I'm just putting myself into the, into the shoes, into the footsteps of the world's top poker player, mm -hmm. who all of a sudden starts working with a coach who isn't giving him actionable steps to take on the poker table, but is more focusing on quite abstract concepts like breathing. I mean, how did he take that when you started working with him? Uh, initially... I would have to say, he would probably say he was a little bit skeptical. Mm. Um, he, needed, he needed convincing. Mm. Uh, but over three days, I was able to show him stuff um, on that, on, uh, that did convince him. Some, mm. some of this heart math stuff, by the way, was on my computer. And it, you know, it produces the graphs. And because he's into numbers and statistics and things, he could see the effect that getting to breathe in the right way was having on his scores. Yeah. In fact, to tell you the kind of person that Chris is, and he won't mind me saying this, he's on his last thing that he did, he scored 99%. And his first reaction was, which was his best ever score, and he said, why wasn't that 100? What did I do <laughs> yeah, wrong? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I said, he's Chris, got that kind of brain. he's got that kind of brain. Yeah. I said, look, Chris, 99 is a phenomenal score. When you leave here, I don't know what you're going to do. Um, I'm getting on the plane later tonight, but I know that I have left your head in a in a good place yeah and if you were pe playing poker right now given luck and the right cards mm. i would be very confident <laughs> but never in my wildest dreams or his yeah. did i imagine that he was going to win a major two weeks later did you work on kind of staying in the moment and being present because that's something that i feel would be quite important when you've made a horrendous mistake like that 
I mean, that's potentially career ending, isn't it? You know, yeah. I mean, I just think of in other sports, you know, when people make embarrassing mistakes, things like that get flashed up on YouTube for years afterwards. So how did he stay in the moment? Well, by by deploying great mental control, yeah. um, which of course he had a lot of that before he even met me, but uh, hopefully through our work, you know, we brought it to another level. Yeah. But uh, poker players will know that when you make a mistake like that, they, you know, they... Because they I it remember a- that you were telling me that earlier in the tournament, he, he, he let his mind drift and he started wandering towards thinking, ah, oh, finally I might be a major winner. Yeah. And perhaps that was a sign at that point that he'd kind of drifted away from being in the present. It was a sign. And the good thing is that as soon as he started to think like that, he recognized it. So staying in the present is the only period of time that we have any degree of control over. Mm. So he was thinking of the winner's speech. Yeah. Which, and he has no control. Oh, that's right. He was thinking of the winner's speech. Yeah, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah, he yeah. won winning the tournament. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. of course, so of course, you know, he hasn't, that's the future. Yeah. We have very little control over the future. Yeah. Likewise, when he made that big mistake on that hand, if he had been beating himself up for the next 20 minutes or half an hour, um, he would, you know, he'd have gone into that downward cycle of negativity mm. that the t- poker players call a tilt, and they know that when you start losing and you start feeling bad, it's almost as if the cards know it, because you, you know, very often the cards you're dealt, you know, become really, really negative too, and the opposite is when you're on a roll and it looks as if all the cards are in your favour and you keep winning and winning and winning, mm. and they call that, you know, the heater. The heater. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it sounds like straight away he had the presence of mind to kind of turn it around and pretend like like he was yeah. he'd actually meant it. Yeah. Um, although now we know, thanks to you and thanks to him having been honest about it as well, that it, yeah. that that wasn't the case. But then also he used the break to use some kind of vaguely meditative exercises to get him back into the zone and back into the present. He would have definitely used these these methods uh, and others that I, that I taught him. And I, I think on his blog he wrote, he said, at this point, he said, I felt relief. I mean, I'm putting my words into his blog. Yeah. But uh, it, more or less he was saying, at this moment, I actually felt a sense of relief because I didn't have anything to lose. Right. If I carried on the way I was going to go, I was going to lose. So there was no choice. I had to move my, my mind into a more positive place. Right. And yeah. once he did, I mean, again, he, he got dealt some really good cards. What did you get? Ten percent. Uh, <laughs> any information like that is entirely confidential, um, and I'm not answering it. Tony, very nice house you're we're sitting outside. You are very, you are very Steve, cheeky uh... to ask that question. Uh, all I can say is that we didn't have any agreement at all, and Chris needn't have paid me a penny. Really? And I wouldn't have asked for it actually. Wow! But I can tell you, he's a generous man. Yeah, fantastic, <laughs> sensational. And now you work with other players as well, don't you? And, and yeah, you do. Uh, yeah. And I guess, um, do you find that? With poker players, you're not just helping them with their poker, but actually the, the benefits from the stuff they w- that you work on with them actually extend into their day-to-day lives as well. Always. Mm. And, and not just with the poker. Any of my clients, it doesn't mm. matter, uh, the golfers, because uh, we don't live in a box. You mm. know, We don't have a little box that says, this is where my poker player lives, and this is where I live with my family, and this is where my hobbies are. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's my... Actually, a, a journalist wrote wrote up this story, and uh, he called it "Mind, Body, and Soul." Right. Because uh, he had asked me, I, he said, "You know, how do you work? What do you work on?" And I said, "Mind, Body, and Soul." Right. Not very original, but it was the best I could come come up <laughs> with. But it's true. Yeah. It's true. So, so now you work with poker players, mm-hmm. and you work with golfers, and, and lots of other people, and, and just some people on including improving their success or their yeah. motivation levels or yeah. I know you work with quite high ranking executives yeah. a chief executive quite a big organisation as well don't uh-huh. you and, yeah indeed um, and they come to you for all different things they come to me for different things yeah. and I would just like to say that you know some of these people are you know VIPs uh, but I also work with ordinary people yeah uh, the, well they're not ordinary I think everybody's special but yeah. I mean for example I know a lot of your people don't live in London, but in London I have a meet-up group yeah. where we meet m- once a month. And I, d- I deliberately price the tickets very, very low because I want people who don't have millions in their bank account to be yeah. able to come. But we talk about the same things. 
we, we need to take a little break, don't we? So let's go off and have our little break and yeah. carry on recording a little bit later. Yeah, because you have, you've exhausted me, Tony. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you don't look like an exhausted man. Um, right, we'll, we'll stop recording. We'll come back in a sec. Okay, thanks, Tony. So um, going back to kind of, I mean, staying in the present, it's so hard to do, isn't it? It's, I think it's just a lifelong pro process to be able to have that self-discipline, not to think about what might have been because of that mistake you made in the past, whatever it might be in whatever sphere you work in or operate in. It's just, it's very difficult to stay in the moment. So, so how? Well, when we are strongly connected to an emotion, particularly if it's a negative one, but as we've mentioned positive emotions can mm. on occasions be uh, dangerous as well. Mm. If we if we can disassociate ourselves from that emotion to drain the emotion out of that situation, we can then look at it in a more analytical and critical way. And something that I, I tell people when we talk about this, one way to do this is to well, one technique is to imagine that you're watching yourself on television, so you're an observer. Mm. You're looking at somebody else who's dealing with these issues. Or another technique that uh, is, uh, some people really like is, okay, and what I might have said to Chris if I was with him at that event, I'd have said, now look, Chris, we know what's happened. Now, if I'd been playing in this tournament and I'd just done the same thing, yeah. what would you say to me? What would you say to me right, right now, yeah, Chris? Yeah, yeah. And he'd have said, oh, "Well, I'll tell you to stop going on about it, Steve. First of all, we don't want to hear about it anymore. You know, you made a mistake. What yeah. are you going to do? Are you going to go back and change the cards? It can't be done. So, this the cards that are going to be dealt with you when you get out of the break. Now, it's the next cards over the next hour that are going to be important. The cards that you played in the last half hour, they're, they're history." Mm disassociating from emotion is really nice isn't it and, and that's an NLP technique that you, you mentioned in terms of looking at yourself on TV and you can add extra layers of disassociation as well can't you so if you're feeling particularly emotional about an, an event and that emotion is holding you back in some way you visualize that event um, looking at yourself looking at a TV so you're adding an extra layer of dissociation and you could make the picture on the TV black and white of, of that event actually happening and a kind of a grainy image so you can't really see it very well yeah. and all those layers of dissociation can help provide this weird mental and I guess metaphorical layer that actually helps you to disassociate from the powerfully negative emotions that you're feeling at the time Indeed so, and your your listeners will know that, um, you know, you're highly qualified in NLP, you're a master practitioner and a trainer as well, which is why you can talk so eloquently about these things. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> so knowledgeably. <laughs> and um, I have the same qualifications as you as well. You do. And I, 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 I hope that I can yeah. just talk such good common sense also. But the way you describe this, I mean, with my clients, I say this is all about the movie that's going on in your head. Mm. Uh, because when people are, you know, you ask people, what are they visualizing? They try and describe like a photograph to you. Well, our brains don't work like that. Yeah. Uh, our brain would much rather have a big movie playing. And a movie is, is made of uh, compelling visual images that are large, that are colorful, that mm. are in perfect focus and bright. They have a soundtrack with beautiful music and people's voices this is what a move this is what the steven spielbergs of this world do they create this compelling dream yeah and um now when we are trying to make somebody feel more confident we ask them to future pace to you know imagining their first major and what it's going to feel like and all the rest of it and build this movie in their head mm. so that hopefully through their their relaxation techniques this becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah but as you mentioned if there's something that we don't want to remember you know like playing those two wrong hand cards in, in poker at a critical point or a particularly stressful experience that we've had in our past life we want to do the opposite the the, the disassociation mm. as, uh, as as you as you said and it's just it is the opposite you drain it you make it into a still picture this movie that's running in your head you drain the color out of it you you make it poorly focused you remove the soundtrack and then you make the thing smaller and smaller you push it and it's as if you're pushing it away to a much much deeper mm. you know safer place in the brain do you think that 
because as you know in in more recent times i've kind of got really into eft which is often known as tapping where you tap on parts of the kind of face and body whilst accessing an emotional uh an emotion that has a lot of charge and by that you kind of associate and access that emotion and then start to deal with it and release it mm. and i actually think i find that a nice way of looking at this almost potentially more effective than some of the nlp approaches because it's not denying it it's saying okay it's here and i want to fully access that emotion and then release it yeah what, what do you think about using tapping for you, you're not really you don't really use eft and tapping much do you i don't no uh, i've been a, a client you know I've, I've i've had some tapping therapy myself and mm. i found it uh, you know powerful uh, you use havening a bit more, don't I, you? I do. Yeah. I use havening. And I, what, I, what is havening again? Um, havening is described as a psychosensory technique. It's it's a way of uh, doing this association. Sounds and pretty weird when you say that. Well, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it psychosensory, in, wow. <laughs> it, it, involves, it involves touch. And uh, uh, you explain that to your... It still sounds pretty weird. Okay. It involves... <laughs> touch of the arms it's a, it's a, yeah. and also it can be the face yeah. but it's a stroking thing of the arms and the reason possibly why it works is that this this is very much an instinctive um, reptilian reflex when a mm. child falls over a mother will rush up or a man or a father for that matter or a bystander mm. and their first in instinct to a child that's hurt itself will be to rub their arms right and give them a hug yes and say oh you know you feel better i'm sorry you know that this happened so don't cry you know reassuring that's what we do and uh, even though we're adults when somebody does it to us we we have the same primitive um uh, relaxation mm. that, that goes with it and our mothers, uh, again, another, a similar thing as uh, when we got on to talking about EFT, you asked me mm. about, you know, uh, how you bring this emotion forward. Well, of course, when we were at school and something upset, upsetting had happened to us and we rushed home and, and mum says, you know, how was your day today? And you said, oh, it was terrible. Oh, and you start crying. Yeah. And then she says, calm down, calm down. Just tell me what happened. Mm. I don't want to talk about it. I do not. It's too, mm. I'm too mm. upset. Mm. And she would say, no, calm down and talk to me because we all know that a problem shared is a problem halved. Right, yeah. And particularly men, although I gather things are changing very rapidly, men, the women tell us that men, we, we do not express your emotions no, I enough. I think that's entirely right, especially um, from certain countries, like the country that we're from, <laughs> but, yes. Uh, but yeah, in general. Yes, yeah. I mean, we were brought up, you know, grown men don't cry, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we know uh, that women are, generally speaking, more highly skilled communicators than men. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, when, when we look at people's brains under the MRI, the, you know, there are sexual differences. The areas that light up, you know, yeah. are bigger in women uh, some women than men and vice Isn't versa. it something like they've studied the average amount of words per day that a man speaks compared to a woman and the, the amount of words that a woman uses on average per day and obviously this is huge broad stroke generalizations yeah. is massively higher than the amount because you know I mean you and I it's pay doing mate yep yeah pretty good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like uh, yeah, so that says um, it all. yeah yeah so um Sorry, I just interrupted you there. What were you saying? Um, I, was just, I was just saying, you know, how um, a, a wise mother saying, you know, yes. tell me about it, talk yes. to me about it. Wise mothers have been saying that for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. And just because they've been doing that doesn't mean, should not devalue it in any way. Mm. I, I feel, uh, to get, you know, to get back really to, I guess, the point of your question, I think that one should bring up emotions that were painful, but in a way that can drain some of the pain away from that and by externalizing it it helps us it helps that emotion to literally evaporate into yeah, thin air yeah. because if we don't bring it in it stays there it mm. will stay in a part of the brain and it can fester and fester yeah. even over the years this might sound like i think for some people this might sound like kind of quite hippy dippy concepts concepts yeah. and i think it's really really important i'm really pleased you brought that up because i just feel that's so important when those emotions aren't released and when they fester on a really basic level 
we start to make it into much more of a deal in our heads than it actually is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I wonder whether people are doing that more than ever because of the nature of life these days where we're becoming, we're living a more online and less community-based lifestyle. Therefore, there's a lot of time to spend in your head. You know, if you're on your own and you're not based with, you're not sitting with other members of your community around the campfire anymore, you've got a lot of time to think about these things that you might make into a bigger deal than they otherwise were. Yeah. I, I know that uh, a lot of teachers are very worried about this now because uh, children don't do the same kind of things that we did when we were at school. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, they still do play sports and all the rest of it, but increasingly they'll be in their bedroom or their study mm. and they'll be doing stuff online or they'll be texting friends that could be the other side of the world mm. rather than actually having full physical engagement uh, you know, with their friends. Havening still sounds... Uh, you, you've shown me Havening and it's cool. I just think it sounds weird to people. But I mean, it's quite. It's used quite a lot. And, and it was Paul McKenna who kind of brought it to a lot of public consciousness, wasn't it? Because with all his years of experience, and he's one of the world's best-selling personal development authors, he started to say how effective he'd found it, didn't he? He, he did. And, uh, you know, guess what? Your timing is pretty much perfect. I have a feeling that today was the exact day three years ago that Paul McKenna brought Havening to the UK. What was that? Um, it was a two-day uh, meeting and he invited some, you know, influential decision makers in various parts of government and education and things. Mm. And I was one of the trainers for that event. Uh, have to say, having... Not not, not knowing very much about Havening mm. at that point, but we had a, a meeting uh, the evening before we went, where we all went through stuff, and the, the originator of Havening, Dr. Ronald Rudin from the States, he'd yeah. flown in, and um, so it was a, it was really was sort of fast-track learning for me, because mm. over the next two days, I was having to help the delegates uh, practice these techniques themselves and deal with the kinds of issues that surfaced. What I will say for it is that it's finally a technique that is not a series of three initials whacked together that nobody knows what, what the hell it is yeah. <laughs> NLP, EFT CBD, yeah. give us something you know like, give us something that we can actually, uh, it's, that's actually CBT isn't it, CBD is the uh, central business area of Sydney <laughs> yeah. but that, that's how confusing it is, so give us techniques that we can actually talk about with a proper name yeah. even so, I mean, uh, I mean you asked me what is havening and uh, havening does not describe describe it does it no, no, um, no. But, the, but again it, it's so hard rubbing would be a bit weird you couldn't even say that <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. um, would you use havening with poker players yeah I often do do you I often do yeah, yeah. I often do in, in fact I'm uh, you know I'm making a, a speech next month to the British havening annual meeting mm. and the only people who will be going are people who've already been certified in this technique and um I'm not quite sure what kind of reception I'm going to get. Um, I'm obviously hoping that it's going to be a very warm and positive one. Mm. But my point of view will be, I don't believe there's any one technique in this world that is vastly superior to all the others. Yeah. If there were, we'd all be doing it. Yes. And the people who taught us NLP... I mean, I remember Richard Bandler and Paul McKenna saying, you know, we want you to go out into the world and to use this stuff, but don't use it necessarily the way we've told you to do it. Uh, you have to blend this in with your own practice mm. and, and use what feels good to you. And that's my approach to havening. I use a ver I've lost count of how many different techniques I've studied over the years. Mm. And I just form my opinion, you know, I'm, when I'm with the client and I've got a very good idea of what their issue is whatever it is that they're looking to reach closure on or the outcome they're looking for i decide what i think is going to be the techniques that are most likely to be effective in them mm. and so i may well use havening in a way that the founder dr rudin would not i mean we're going to find that out next month yeah. but i have a feeling that he would say steve whatever works for you what's important really is that you don't make any client any worse and hopefully you produce enough successes to make it worthwhile mm. and the results uh, at the end the results are what counts for the client and I think in terms of 
my work i know that sounds kind of you know a little bit lofty in terms of ambition but in terms of what we do with the podcast and probably yours as well with with, with everything that you do i think encouraging people to use these techniques and say and demystifying them to a certain extent as well and saying to people who might never have thought about trying anything with three initials in it ever saying look you know what a lot of people are using these and a lot of people are finding it quite helpful and you might find it helpful or you might not but if you've been living feeling a little bit miserable or in pain or emotionally torn up about something that's affecting your life and not you're not able to move on just giving something a go is definitely worth it and so demystifying with a slightly skeptical approach but saying have a go at it i think is really important and just doing what works as you say yeah if, if, if you're dealing with an issue or perhaps an illness or something then there is absolutely no point to carry on living your same life mm. because it was that same life that one way or the other resulted in the way you are right now mm. you have to do something different einstein said it didn't he you know one of his famous quotes the definition of insanity is when mm. somebody keeps doing the same thing yeah. time and time again expecting a different result yeah. all, all of the great people in 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 the world throughout history they've made a lot of mistakes but they've kept on going they've kept on exploring different avenues until Mm. eventually they've gained enough knowledge often through things that didn't work that they come up with the answer Mm. now there's a health and safety warning on this one as well obviously when you're trying new stuff you know do make sure that it's uh, there is no great disproportionate risk to your health or well-being in in that so make sure that you're working with people who are you know probably qualified and mm-hmm. giving you the best possible advice but definitely I, I mean this come this happens all the time to me you know I, I might get an email from me from somebody who's been diagnosed with cancer and they say you know I, I don't, I've heard about the side effects with chemotherapy I I, I don't want to go through that. I, uh, is there some sort of special diet I could do or some special technique that you might know of that, right. that, that would, would help me? Yeah. And I always say the same thing. I said, look, I can understand your worries about chemotherapy. Um, you're the patient, but you're the person in charge of your body. You owe it to yourself to talk to these specialists who are highly qualified and... F- and, and get some idea of the risk-benefit, mm. yes? What are the side effects of the chemotherapy going to be? But what is the, the chance of success? And some of these treatments are highly successful, and you'd be crazy not to take them. Mm. Uh, whereas other treatments, the, the, the b- border, the boundary between uh, the likelihood of success and the likelihood mm. of having serious consequences from the treatment... Yeah are much more murky right but yeah. any good professional medical or other person mm. would be happy to explain their risk risks to you mm. and then at the end of the day there's only one person who can make that decision yeah yeah steve's been great as always always enjoy uh, recording podcasts with you and i hope you've enjoyed listening to this with the the birds kind of chirruping and the occasional sound of a golfer whooping in satisfaction or grunting in dismay as their ball goes in the water. And the um, lawnmower in the distance and the odd golf buggy reversing over there as well. <laughs> there's, there's plenty to listen to out here, that's for certain. Um, I've asked you this loads of times, so I'm going to ask you again. Um, it might be a book that you're reading now or it might be one that you've mentioned before. It doesn't really matter. But what is one book that you'd recommend and one tip for living with more energy, vitality and motivation? So one book and one tip well i've read so many books as you have on these subjects and uh, most of them are pretty good and while we were talking in my study earlier on uh, we're in portugal i've got to study back in london Mm. and my library is split up between the two Mm. and i and for some reason i was my eyes were drawn to this book and it was uh called the the chimp paradox oh yeah by dr steve peters yeah. he's a doctor he's a psychiatrist uh but has also done some great work with uh, athletes mm. and his book is full of tips but the one that i that came to me from nowhere is never make any decision at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> I think he says something like, don't make any decision until seven or eight in the morning. And there's some really good reasons for that. Right. I mean, our hormone levels are very low in the small hours of the morning. It's when we're, we're supposed to be sleeping. But uh, for many of us, it's when we wake up and we start worrying about the things that are on our mind. Mm. And uh, 
a decision made then will maybe not be a very good helpful one so i would try i always try and follow that and when i'm having the uh, the negative vibes uh trying to invade my brain at four o'clock in the morning i think of that thing in the in mm. steve peter's book and uh when i wake up uh, in the morning and think about it i realize it wasn't quite as gloomy as i thought then and in terms of um, hormones and circadian rhythms and everything else i guess if you are awake at four o'clock in the morning and wanting to go to sleep and worrying on something mm. how much an indication of uh is that that your body's almost trying to tell you something in that well the fact that you're awake worrying about this thing rather than sleeping soundly means that maybe it's the first time that you've had over the last 24 hours that you haven't been so overstimulated that you've been able to listen to your body and realize that there is something that you need to change in terms of your um kind of self-care that's a really good point actually and it is true so as i when i said you know never make a decision at four o'clock in the morning uh, that doesn't mean to say that you should ignore that thought that woke you up because that thought is prodding you, as you quite rightly say. Mm-hmm. So I guess if what you would say to yourself is, I'm not going to think about this now, but it's obviously on my mind. Mm. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to go for a walk or whatever. And I'm going to think about this problem. I may pick up the phone and ask somebody else for some advice. So you're not saying you're making a decision now, but you're definitely not going to let that thought disappear either. Mm, mm. And, some, and just by saying that to yourself may, may just calm the mind enough and you'll go back to sleep. If that doesn't work, well, people go and get themselves a glass of milk. Some people, don't they? Yeah. Uh, typically, I might just you know, read a book for 20 minutes. Mm. That takes your mind off it. And then because your body is still actually crying out for sleep, your chances are you'll drift off. Mm. Um, and we're going to leave it there because we, um, first I'm getting burnt. Here. <laughs> I can't believe this. Beautiful weather. Yeah. Um, the forecast wasn't great, but it's, it's lovely. And what are we off to do now? A bit of a stroll? Yeah. Well, I mean, can you believe, Tony? I think there must be something a little bit magic about you. Uh, two or three hours ago, we were in the car and there was a torrential storm. Yeah. And here we are just a short time later with blue skies and it's, it's very warm, definitely. It's, we're, we're in paradise. We can get down to the beach from here, can't yeah, we? Yeah, so what are we going to do? We're going to go for a lovely walk. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. It's been, as always, been great talking to you. And where can people find out more about you and what you do and the work you do, not just with poker players, but uh, people from all different walks of life, sport uh, and everything else? Uh, well, that counts for everything, doesn't it? Yeah. The best place to go goes to my website, and I try and put as much stuff on uh, as mm. possible on there. And that's got links to YouTube. Uh, I've made a lot of over a hundred videos, um, and there are, I think, they're just about all of them are free. Mm. So, for people who are interested in this kind of stuff, please look at my website. Please go to YouTube, and of course, if you have any questions or comments, write me an email, and I promise you'll get a reply. Wonderful, Steve. Thanks again. My pleasure, Tony. Thanks for having me on the show. That's it for this week's Zestology. If you enjoyed it, there's um, plenty of other podcasts that feature Dr. Stephen Simpson. So if you want to go back into the Zestology archives, episode two was 14 different ways to chill out with elite performance coach Dr. Stephen Simpson. That was the second Zestology we ever recorded. And another one you could listen to is episode 17, and that is the meditation gadget that could change your life brackets maybe (laughs) and there's another one as well which is goal setting and making 2016 your best year ever and uh, that was one that we uh, published on uh, new year's day this year and that is zestology episode 43 so plenty for you in the archives uh, if you want to hear a little bit more of dr stephen simpson and i'll see you next week on zestology